Hello everyone. I, architect Shashi Singh, along with architect Saloni Bandhu, assistant professors at APJ School of Architecture and Planning, Greater Noida, are going to present the lecture on the vernacular architecture of world of temperate zone with the help of few examples. As we all know, the whole world has been categorized into six climatic zones that is polar, temperate, arid, tropical, mediterranean and mountains. In this lecture, we will cover vernacular architecture of regions that come under temperate zone. We will be covering three examples. First one is Blackstone House in Scotland. Second one is Fujin Tulo in China. And third one is Iron Age Roundhouses in Cornwall, England. Regions falling in temperate climatic zone have cold winters and mild summers. There are no extreme climatic conditions and the four seasons are almost equally long. To achieve climate responsive architecture, following rules need to be followed in temperate regions. First one is balanced strategies need to be followed between cold and hot humid climate. Secondly, we need to understand the natural benefits of solar angles that shade during warm months but allow for heating in colder months. Thirdly, we can construct cavity walls, provide terrace gardens, green roofs, light shelves, etc. Fourth point is, we should go for roof insulation by using insulation material, clay pots, etc. First example of vernacular building is Fujian Tulo which is found in China. The Fujian Tulo also called Fujian Earthen buildings are the rural dwellings of China. Most of the Hakka people living in mountainous areas in southeastern Fujian of China used to build such structures during 12th to 20th centuries. Now what is a Tulo? Tulo is a large enclosed and fortified earth building which are commonly in rectangular or circular shape having very thick load bearing walls. These are generally 3 to 5 story high and used as a residence by a community that is a group of families and it houses approximately 800 people. It has smaller interior buildings and are often enclosed by the huge peripheral walls which can contain halls, storehouses, wells and living areas. Thus, the whole structure looks like a small fortified city. Geographical settings Fujian is situated on the southeastern coast of China opposite to the island of Taiwan. It is bordered by Zhejiang to the north, Jiangxi to the west, and Guangdong to the southwest. East China Sea lies to the northeast, the Taiwan Strait to the east, and South China Sea to the southeast. The capital of Fujian is Fuzhou, which is also the largest city. This region is one of the most picturesque in Asia, having wooded hills, winding streams, 
orchards, tea gardens and terraced rice fields on the gentler slopes. Most of the Fujian is mountainous except some narrow coastal plains. The drainage area of the Min River of Fujian covers around half of the province. Now we'll discuss the climate of Fujian. Fujian lies to the north of the Tropic of Cancer. The climate along the coastal areas is semi-tropical, that is, winters are cool and summers are hot. The mean temperature ranges from 29 degrees Celsius to 11 degrees Celsius in the month of July and January respectively. There are three seasons in a year, that is cool season from November to February, warm season March to May and hot season from June to October. The northwestern mountains have a temperate climate. Summer is dominated by monsoonal tropical airflow from the sea. Rainfall increases from the coast to the western mountains. There are some precipitation in winter with occasional snowfall in northwest. The coast faces typhoons during late summer and early autumn. People and settlement patterns in Fujian Han make up nearly all of the population. The largest ethnic minority group consists of Shi tribes, people known as Hone or Hyone. The Hakka people who live in Fujian are located in the hilly hinterland of the northern coast. The Hakka people were migrants from North China who moved southwards on the later part of the Song dynasty in between 961 to 1276 AD and were confined to remote areas. They were not welcomed and had to build their houses in a protective way. They lived in families and clans together and dubbed a particular concentric form of living. They are mostly engaged in farming. Half of Fujian's population live in rural areas having less population density in mountain uplands, more in river valleys and highest in coastal plains. Fujian is one of the most culturally and linguistically diverse provinces in China. Most commonly spoken language is by Min Chinese along with Hokkien dialects of southeastern Fujian. Hakka people speak Hakka Chinese also. Many well-known teas originate from Fujian like Oolong, Wuyi, Yancha, Lapsong, etc. Fujian tea ceremony is an elaborate way of preparing and serving tea. The predominant religions in Fujian are Chinese folk religions, Taoist traditions and Chinese Buddhism. To celebrate Chinese festival, dragon dance were performed, which can be seen in the image on the right side of the slide. The folk artwork of Fujian province is puppet head carving in Zhangzhou in South China's Fujian province. Sculpting Zhangzhou puppets incorporates the head, limbs, costumes and headgear. But carving the puppet heads is the most representative of this craft. The puppet's heads are vivid and lively with exaggerated facial expressions in specific genres. Talking about music, Hakka music is literary and laid back in tone and consists entirely of five notes. Shefan is a kind of music that dates to the 
क्विंग डायनेस्टी विच इट वॉज काइंड ऑफ क्यूसिव म्यूजिक दैट एकम्पनीड द ड्रैग ड्रैगन लैंटन डांस लेटर ऑन स्ट्रिंग एंड विंड इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स वर ऑल्सो एडेड This is the vernacular building called Fujian Tulo. Fujian Tulo is a large multi-story building which is found in the mountainous region of southeast Fujian. It is meant for large community living and defense and built with load-bearing rammed earth wall and wooden frame structure. There are various types of Fujian tulo found few having characteristics of Hakka and others of Minan When we look at the layout of the Tulo building we find that it follows the Chinese dwelling tradition of closed outside and open inside concept that means an enclosed wall with living quarters around the peripheral having a central common courtyard a small building at the center with open front served as an ancestral hall for ancestry worshiping festivals meetings weddings funerals and other ceremonial functions The shape of the ground floor plan can be a circle, semicircle, oval, square, rectangular or irregular pentagon. But the most common shapes are circular and rectangular. The foundation of Tulo is built with paved stones on top of compacted earth ground in 2 to 3 tiers. There is a circular drain around the top tier the foundation to prevent rain water from damaging the tulo wall the walls of the tulo were generally load bearing consisting of two sections the lower sections and the upper section the lower section is built from cut stone blocks or river cobbles held together with lime sand and clay mixture up to 1 to 2 meters height the height was decided according to the regional flood water level the upper section of wall was constructed above stone section with compacted earth the earth wall has mixed with sticky rice and reinforced with horizontal bamboo sticks The walls were built inclined towards the center so that the natural force of gravity pushes the wall together. This technique was used in the construction of pagoda of Fogong Temple. The thickness of wall decreases with height. The lower two stories are solid without any window or gun hole. Only from third to fifth story windows were provided because rooms at the bottom story was used as family storage rooms and upper stories were used as living quarters. Now we'll have a look at the roofs of Tulo. The roof tops were covered with baked clay tiles. which are arranged radially using inverted y insertion techniques which was used at regular intervals to compensate for larger circumferences at the outside the roof tiles were laid from top to bottom and the gap caused by radial layout was compensated by small sections of tiles laid in inverted y shape which helped in laying the tiles radially without any visual gap in continuation with the previous slide 
the eaves of the roof extended up to 2 meters which protect the earth wall from damage caused by rainfall pouring from the eaves the wooden frame supported the rooftop now corridors and staircases of tulo circular corridors were provided second to uppermost level made of wooden boards laid on horizontal wooden beams with one end inserted into the earth wall corridors have wooden railings also the staircases are evenly distributed around the corridors generally four staircases were provided and each stairwell starts from ground floor to the topmost floor provision of water well public water wells 2 to 3 in numbers are located at the central court luxurious tulos have an house water well for each household in ground floor kitchen most tulos have inbuilt pipes to protect the upper wooden floor against fire these are few examples of various types of tulos the largest round tulos are the chang ki lu in yongding county having a diameter of 62.5 meters another one is shunyo lo in nanjing county having diameter of 74.1 meters which was built in 1933 having four layers its outer wall is 15 meter high and 1.6 meter thick it has 64 rooms one main entrance and two side doors third example is fusheng lo in chendong village of yongding county which has diameter of 77.42 meters It was built in 1981. The smallest tulo is called Kulin Lo in Nankang Township of Nanjing County. Its diameter is 14 meters, having three stories. It was built in 1617. One of the oldest tulo is the elliptic tulo Kuyon Lo in Shenzhen village of. Yuan County. It was built in 1371. Examples of few notable Fujian tulos are Chuxi Tulo Cluster, which is located in Yongding County. It belongs to the Chuxi Tulo Group, which was built in 1419. It consists of two concentric rings. The outer ring building is four stories tall, having fifty-three rooms on each level. The outer ring consists of seventy-two staircases. The second ring is a single-story building. The second one is called Zhangcheng Lo, which is located in. Hong Kong village of Yongding County. It belongs to the Hong Kong Tulo cluster. It was built in 1912. It is a double ring tulo having the outer ring of four stories which consists of 184 rooms and the inner ring which is two story high having 32 rooms. The outer ring was partitioned into four segments according to bagua concept of the chinese feng shui western in fluena can be seen in the greek style columns of the ancestral hall and in the wrought iron railing of the second level corridor Examples of few notable Fujian tulos are Chuxi Tulo Cluster which is located in Yongding County. 
It belongs to the Chuxi Tulo group, which was built which was built in 1419. It consists of two concentric rings. The outer ring building is four stories tall, having 53 rooms on each level. The outer ring consists of 72 staircases. The six single story building. The second one is called Zhenchang Lu, which is located in Hongkang village of Yongding County. It belongs to the Hongkang Tulu cluster. It was built in 1912. It is a double ring Tulu having the outer ring of four stories, which consists of 184 rooms and the inner ring which is two story high having 32 rooms the outer ring was part was partitioned into four segments according to bagua concept of the chinese feng shui western influence can be seen in the greek style columns of the ancestral hall and in the wrought iron railing of the second level corridor Third example of the notable Fujian Tulo is Chenkui Lu, which is located at Gaobi village of Yongding County. It belongs to the Gaobi cluster, which was built in 1709. It is a massive round, round Tulo having four concentric rings surrounding an ancestral hall at the center. The diameter of the outer ring is 62.6 meters. It is four stories high, having 288 rooms, that is 70 rooms at each level. Fourth example is Tian Liu Kang Tulu Cluster, which is located at Fujian province in southern China. It belongs to the Quintet Cluster, consisting of five tulos with a square buyon lo at the center surrounded by three rotunda tulos and an oval tulo forming a pattern of four dishes and a soup fifth one is yu chang lo located at nanjing county it is a five story high tulo the diameter of outer ring is 36 meters and it is five story high there are total 50 ro 50 rooms on each floor and total 270 rooms the sixth famous tulo is called airy loop it is located at zhangzhou city huan county it belongs to daddy tulu cluster it consists of four stories, the outer ring and one story inner ring. The diameter of outer ring is 71 meters, having 48 rooms at each level. Arielo has no circular corridor at the front of each upper level. Instead, it has a back corridor adjacent to the wall. The seventh one is known as Nanzi, which is located in Yukang town. Eighth one is called Hegulo. It is the largest rectangular tulo. Having an area of 3000 square meters, its total height is 21.5 meters and has five stories. It was built on swamp land and is the tallest of the rectangular shaped tulos. In the next slide, I would take you to the world of Tulos in which you will experience the size, scale and details of it along with its beauty. So let's move to the video.
Now we'll discuss the vernacular building called Black Houses which is found in the temperate regions of Scotland. This will be discussed in detail in further slides. Let's first know what is a black house. A black house is a traditional kind of house which used to be a common house in the highlands of Scotland. The Hebrides and Ireland. It was called black house due to the darkness inside the house as there was no window provided. Since black houses are mainly found in Scotland, we need to know the climate of that place. Scotland has a very changeable climate. There are wide variations in the climate throughout the day and it varies over small distances also. Although Scotland just touches on the Arctic Circle, the Gulf Stream winds manage to keep the temperature relatively mild. In the highlands, the weather can turn extreme at any time. Scotland's east coast tends to be cool and dry. In winter, the temperature rarely drops below freezing. On the west coast, it is a lot milder and wetter with average highest summer temperatures of around 19 degrees Celsius. Scotland's driest months are May and June. The warmest are July and August. In northern Scotland, the summer sun barely sets while during the winter months, it hardly rises at all. Geographical settings of Scotland will be discussed now. Scotland is bounded on the south by England, to the west and north by Atlantic Ocean and on the eastern side by the North Sea. The west coast is fringed by deep indentions and by numerous islands varying in size from mere rocks to the large land masses of Lewis and Harris, Sky and Hull. The island clusters of Orkney and Shetland lie to the north. Due to the deep penetrations of the sea in the sea lots and firths, most places are within 40 to 50 miles. Settlement Patterns In earlier period, that is before the introduction of crofting at the beginning of the 19th century, the farms on the highland estates were run by taxmen who paid a rent to the clan chief. On each farm, there would be a small settlement whose inhabitants would pay their rents to the taxmen. The system of farming used was known as run rig. This was when the fields were worked, worked communally and in rotation. Due to the collective method of farming, black houses were clustered together into small clachan, normally close to the freshwater source. Crofting saw the disappearance of the taxmen and the division of the farms into apportionments where each tenant had their own piece of land. The black houses were rebuilt on each croft, usually on the worst arable land. When we talk about the culture and traditions of Scotland, Scottish music is the most significant which has both traditional and modern influences. One of the famous Scottish instrument is the Great Highland Bagpipe which is a wind instrument consisting of three drones and a melody pipe called the Chanter 
which are fed continuously by a reservoir of air in a bag their traditional dances have been categorized into four that is silid k britain step dancing scottish country dancing and highland dancing the long houses the black houses of the highlands of scotland were byer dwellings in the traditions of long houses which have existed northern europe for over a thousand years originally black houses didn't have chimneys or windows and were built with locally available materials like stone turf thatch of reeds oats barley or marron grass found usually on the worst arable land coming to the detailed description of the black houses the dwellings had double wall dry stone walls which were packed with earth these walls supported the rafters which was covered with a thatch of turf with cereal straw or reed the floor was usually made of flag stones or packed earth there was a hearth at the center of the house for the fire no chimney was there for the smoke to escape so the smoke went out through the roof the black houses was used to accommodate people and livestock people lived at one end and the animals lived at the other end and there was a partition between them Now we'll discuss in detail the architecture of the black houses which shows that it is an environment friendly building. First we will analyze the siting. The black houses are low and sunk into the contours of the land which reduces wind exposure and heat loss. Now the fireplace The fireplace was generally located at the center of the floor and there was no provision of chimney. Thus, it was energy efficient as it kept the interiors warm. The walls and the roof of black houses. The thick stone walls and earthen floor absorbed the heat of the fire during the night the earth core of the walls has good insulation and keeps out draught through the dry stone wall the turf and thick thatch are also good insulates talking about the livestock the cow and cattle were generally kept under the same roof as humans mainly during winter season so that cow remained in good health and could give good milk the livestock benefited from the warmth of the fire and also gave large quantities of heat itself from its body and manure the manure The byer or the cow shed was at the lower end of the house so that the urine would drain into the arable land the ammonia from the urine helped to sterilize the house the byer is cleaned during spring season and the accumulated manure were used as fertilizers on the fields for the crops For this purpose human waste was also collected and urine was used for treating fabrics like tweed Now the smoke The peat smoke from the open fire would fill the house and act as a sterilizer that kill germs and bugs It would escape by seeping through the thatch and reaching it with soot The soot saturate thatch was removed periodically and used as fertilizers for the crops. Now 
Now we'll see how the form and plan of black houses are climate responsive. The form and siting of the black houses as discussed earlier was influenced by the fear of storms. The house was low and contour hugging, often being built into the slope or embankments. The roof was rounded, leaving no sharp edges for the wind to catch. Coming to the plan. The openings were almost universally on the east side of the building so that the southwesterly prevailing winds hit only the blank walls where there were no openings. The construction method needs to be discussed in detail now. Generally, a black house consists of a long narrow building often with one or more additional buildings laid parallel to it which share common wall. As mentioned earlier, the walls were made from an inner and outer layer of unmortared stones and the gap was filled with peat and earth. The roof was based on a wooden frame which rested on the inner stone walls which was covered by the overlapping layers of turfs. This was again covered with a layer of thatch which was secured by an old fishing net or by twine attached to large rocks whose weight held everything down. More rocks would be laid around the bottom of the roof where it met the inner wall. The section shown here gives detailed idea about the structure and finishes of the black houses. In this case, two black houses are shown having a common wall. At the bottom, the walls are shown which are dry stone placed in two layers, inner and outer and in between peat and earth is filled. This is mentioned in extreme left side of the image at the center the wall head is marked which is provided in between the two black houses to have a platform for building the roof as well as for improving the drainage on the upper portion of extreme right side of the image the top of the wall is shown which were topped with a thick layer of clay to keep the water out of the earthen core. The bottom right portion marked shown shows a foundation layer of pebbles which prevented the walls from slipping on the clay beneath. The section in this slide explains in detail the various parts or elements of the black house. As we know, the material used are stone, wood, earth, thatch or turf, straw or reed and rope. The section shows the details of walls constructed at the bottom having inner and outer dry stone wall and the gap in between is filled with tempered earth. The roof structure is made of timber having purlins, tie beams etc. which is covered with turf and then with thatch. The thatch is tied with the help of rope and at the end of the rope there are also anchor stones which help the roof to keep it tightly. The enlarged sketch shows the detail of the entrance door. The roof traditionally had no chimney. The smoke from the peat fire in the central hearth found its own way out. The smoked thatch was considered as an excellent fertilizer and it was normal to strip it off for this purpose and rethatch the roof each year. The floor of the living area was generally flagged. The animals would be at one end of the house and in the byre area there would be earth flooring 
usually with a drain for some of the animal waste. Part of the black house would also be used as a barn for storage and processing of grain and other products. These are few images showing the interior views of the black houses. The image at extreme left shows a very small opening of the black house and the seating area. Central image at the bottom shows the storage area and the upper image gives us a clear picture of the central hearth. The image at the extreme right shows the internal structural members along the wall and roof. This is the area where animals were kept. Next slide will take us to the black houses settlement area having a number of black houses constructed showing all its parts in detail. So here is the video. The third example of vernacular building in the areas of temperate zone is the Iron Age roundhouses which is found in the village of Bodrifty in Cornwall, England. Let's have a brief overview of this particular vernacular building called roundhouse. This is located at Bodrifty farm in Cornwall, England. Earlier, most of the Britain was covered with round houses having a simple shape including the largest space for the least use of materials. Bodrifty is the modern name of an Iron Age village which is now in ruins. It is 700 yards west of Mulfra Hill in Penwith district, 3 miles north northwest of Penzance and 1.5 miles southwest of Port Muir, on the high ground of the watershed between the Atlantic and the English Channel. The area around Bodrifty has surviving evidence of occupation from Neolithic times through the Bronze Age and Iron Age, medieval times through to the mines of the 18th and 19th century. The round house is built where excavations in the 1950s found an Iron Age settlement of eight round houses within a low enclosing bank. The image shown in upper right corner is a reconstruction of one of the round houses at the farm. It differs from most timber round houses as its walls are stone slabs with a round conical thatch roof made of wood and timber. The geographical settings. The geography of Cornwall describes the extreme southwestern peninsula of England, west of the river Tamar. It is the only country in England bordered by only one other country, Devon, and is the ninth largest country by area, encompassing 3,653 square kilometers. Cornwall is exposed to the full force of the prevailing southwesterly winds that blow in from the Atlantic Ocean. To the north is the Celtic Sea and to the south the English Channel. 
Bodrefti village is located on the high ground of the watershed between the Atlantic and the English Channel in the pen with district of West Cornwall. The ancient trackway which runs from near lands end eastward crosses through it. The trade was fortin which they dug here and exported. Bodrefti is a complete village and fossilized farming system stem which has survived almost intact as its walls were made of granite now the climate of cornwall cornwall has a temperate oceanic climate with mild winters and cool summers hot weather is rare it has the mildest and sunniest climate in the united kingdom due to its oceanic setting and the influence of the gulf stream the average annual temperature in cornwall ranges from 11.6 degree celsius on the isles of scilly to 9.8 degree celsius in the central uplands winters amongst the warmest in the country due to the moderating effects of the warm ocean currents frost and snow are very rare at the coast in the central upland areas summers are however not as warm as those of other areas in southern england the surrounding sea and its southwesterly position mean that cornwall's weather is relatively changeable Settlement patterns in Bodrefti village is described in detail in this slide. The Bodrefti roundhouse settlement which was occupied for 1000 years lies a few miles northwest of Penzance in the middle of the Penwith Peninsula. It is also an area rich in monuments from the Bronze Age, seven being stone circles or whole stones. The Bodrefti settlement started in the late Bronze Age but is classed as Iron Age and is one of 30 Iron Age sites. The village site is of particular interest as it was occupied from the later Bronze Age to the late Iron Age. The early houses have southwest facing doorways and the later one like the replica are facing south east probably due to the climate change next is the culture and traditions the traditional dress of cornwall for women is a bal maidens or fish wives costume which includes the wearing of a bonnet known as gul which were peculiar to a district or community apron and woolen shawls men used to wear fishermen's smocks gionse sweaters which was known as worsted frocks in corn and long cut shirts There is a long tradition of processional dance and music in Cornwall. The best known tradition is the Halston Furry. The term furry is used generally to describe such a dance or or the tune which is associated to it. These bands have been referred to as crowders and homers and generally have a motley mix of instruments with instruments such as fiddle bagpipe or crowdy crown mixed up with brass reed and anything that can be carried cornwall has a rich and vibrant folk music tradition which has survived into the present now the round houses will be discussed in detail 
Generally, most of the British round houses had walls of wood and mud, of which only obscure traces remain. The earlier houses were small and had doorways facing southwest. Later on, larger houses were constructed and had doorways facing southeast towards the sun but away from the prevailing wind. Fragments of banks, perhaps walls of gardens are attached to same houses. The surrounding enclosure wall was built to protect their cattle and sheep. The Bodrifty roundhouse replica based on the largest of the original structures has an internal diameter of 8.5 meters, an external di diameter of 13 meters and a height of 13.1 meters and a roof pitch of 49 degrees. The finished replica is an interpretation of the largest roundhouse at Bodrifty village, which is itself surprisingly well preserved after more than 2000 years with walls still 4 feet high in some places. It is said to be one of the best roundhouse remains of its type. The materials which are being used to construct it are granite stones, reeds, oak, hazelnuts, and wrap, which is a local subsoil mixed with lime. The roof rests on a ring of oak pillars with hazelnuts to support the reed. The gaps in the stone walls are filled with wrap. Now we'll understand the step-by-step -step construction of the roundhouses. Firstly, the first image shows the remains of the early roundhouse. The reconstruction of this type of hut A is done having similar massive walls and the materials used are like granite, ramp, etc. The second image shows laying of stones which weighed around 2 tons and which was used to construct walls. The third step is construction of roof with oak, ash, hazelwood which are cut locally. This step is discussed in detail in later slides. Image 4 shows the rafters which is resting on oak wall plate pegged to form a continuous ring and near the top on a ring beam in the form of a double hexagon which was supported by 6 posts. Figure 5 shows the lashing on hazel lath. Figure 6 shows the oak lintel spanning the doorway which completes the ring of the wall beam. The cone of the roof is stable even without the massive granite walls. This ring beam sits on thin walls of fortalin top. Image 7 shows how caulking of the walls is done with rab, which is a local soil mixed with lime. The bottom outer ring is of holly and designed to elevate the bottom ring of thatch. The eight step involves the knot tying of the double hex ring beam. In the ninth image, it shows the step in which the thatch is battened on by swinging the hazel sways to the inside hazel lap. Tenth step involves profiling the reed with a homemade swing machine called Leggett. The eleventh image finally shows the finished roundhouse. In the next slide, I would show you a video of the Bodrifty village showing the ruins of the roundhouses there.
थैंक यू